So some of you joining us online and here in person expected to hear the next segment in our Supernatural series. I mean, Derek said it several times during the sermon, that's next week, that's next week. <laughs> he did it like that too. It's not this week. However, <laughs> fear not, he will bring us the message, part two of angels on the 12th. But for now, we get to hear something a little different. When Pastor Derek let me know on Friday that he had tested positive for COVID, I, I opened up the daily devotional on my Bible app, and it was John 20, verse 21. Jesus said, peace be with you. This statement, this, this command, it, it spoke to me because we live in a world where we are so deeply in need of peace. We heard it in our prayers this morning. We seek a peace that passes all understanding, as the Apostle Paul wrote. Well, let's look at today a little bit. Could you go back one slide? Back, back. one more. There we go. Um, yeah, I meant to meet with him earlier. Well, anyways, okay, check this out. Today is the last regular Sunday in the season of Eastertide. And a lot of you might be thinking, well, that was two months ago. That was Easter. Well, the Christian liturgical calendar holds the 50 days following Easter as a special time when we focus on Jesus' resurrection together. It's why the pyramids up here and on the cross have remained white. While our sermon series since Easter may not have been specific to the resurrection each time, we do preach the gospel. Jesus was born, lived, died, rose again, and ascended into heaven. This past Thursday was actually the recognition of the ascension of the Lord, 40 days past Easter, representative of the 40 days Jesus walked again on the earth with his disciples before ascending to heaven. Now, next week is Pentecost Sunday, as we've already heard today, and, and that one's a little more well-known. It's the end, the official end of Eastertide, when we celebrate the gift of the Holy Spirit that fell on Jesus' disciples in Jerusalem. And we will indeed celebrate that important day next Sunday alongside the members of the Micronesian Congregation God Information Church that meets here every evening on Sunday. It will truly be a day of many nations, languages, and cultures as they are united by the Holy Spirit in this place and around the world. Well, today, we look to Apostle John's gospel and Jesus' appearance to his disciples following his bodily resurrection. So I invite you to open your Bibles, your Bible apps, or follow along on the screen as we look at John chapter 20, verses 19. Through 22. On the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were together, with the doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, Jesus came and stood among them and said, Peace be with you. After he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I I'm sending you. And with that, he breathed on them and said, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive anyone's sins, their sins are forgiven. And if you don't, they are not forgiven. The word of the Lord. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you for your spirit, your spirit in our lives every day of the week, not just on Sundays, everywhere we are, not just in church. We ask that your spirit would open our ears and our eyes to your messages for us today. Lord, speak your truth through the lips of this servant. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. I just realized I continued to read there and added an extra verse, but we're not going to get that one to, to that one today. Well, last week, as I mentioned, Pastor Derek introduced us to angels. And he wanted to make sure we knew angels are real. Angels exist. And we're reminded that they're not just the chubby little babies floating in the clouds, but 
oftentimes have the appearance of a grown human, and sometimes they're downright terrifying. Why else would the first words from an angel's mouth be, fear not, or do not be afraid? There's something kind of scary there. Well, likewise, the disciples, when encountering the risen Savior, are given a greeting to soothe them somewhat. Peace be with you. I mean, it, it's not every day that someone you know to be dead and buried shows up in a locked room you're in to say, hi there. In most recent popular fiction, this is a sign of the zombie apocalypse. So I, I think it's quite fitting that a word of comfort, of, of safety, of normalcy, of peace is one that needs to be given and change the scene where this group of disheveled, heartbroken men have gathered together. So that's the first of three main things that Jesus brings in these initial greetings to the disciples, locked in a room out of fear and anguish. Jesus brings peace. And it's a special kind of peace that the world has never seen. And who knows what it's like to be in that room, cowering in fear when the Lord shows up. Singer-songwriter Don Francisco in his song, He's Alive, describes it this way. Suddenly the room was filled with a strange and sweet perfume. Light that came from everywhere drove the shadows from the room. Jesus stood before me with his arms held open wide. I fell down on my knees, clung to him, and cried. He raised me to my feet, and as I looked into his eyes, love was shining out from him like sunlight from the skies. Guilt and my confusion disappeared in sweet release. And this is how the song ends. And every fear I'd ever had just melted into peace. Jesus removes from their hearts all fear which his sudden and unannounced appearance might have occasioned. He removes the fear that they had that they were going to be killed and suffer the same fate as him. And Jesus quiets each uneasy conscience with his peace. Arthur Pink, in his exposition on the Gospel of John, says, having put away their sins, he could now remove their fears. Be not afraid. I have come not as judge to reckon with your disloyalty and unbelief, nor do I enter as one who has been injured by you to reprimand. No, I bring from my sepulcher something very different than a rebuke. Peace be unto you. That was the blessed greeting of the Prince of Peace, and none but he can speak it. My personal favorite Bible commentary, uh, commentator, William Barclay, Chris, if you could move the next slide, writes of Jesus' greeting that he gave them the normal, everyday Eastern greeting. Peace be with you. It means far more than, may you be saved from trouble. No, it means, may God give you every good thing. This is the kind of peace that Jesus brings through the work of of the Holy Spirit. More than a lack of violence and aggression, it is the fulfillment of good things in place of those that had us fighting with God and fighting with one another. I remember taking the course Introduction to Peace Studies when I was in college, and the very first thing that was taught was that peace is not, or that peace is most often under, misunderstood as merely an absence of hostility. However, true lasting peace brings with it reconciliation, healing, and restoration to all involved. Jesus brings peace. The second thing that Jesus brings to the disciples in this scene is a call to action. As the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. Jesus' peace is not content to lie dormant but is imbued with vigor, strength, and a mission. Barclay writes that a person who is sent out needs someone to send them. They need a message to take. 
They need a power and an authority to back their message. They will need someone to whom they can turn to when they are in doubt and difficulty. Without Jesus, the church has no message. Without him, the church has no power. Without him, we have no one to turn to when we're up against. What can you imagine? Without Jesus, the church has nothing to enlighten her mind, to strengthen her arms, to encourage her heart. This is not an empty peace that Jesus brings. That term empty peace I'm using, it, you know, when I consider this lack of turmoil, there's a vision that comes into my head. I recall the movie The Time Machine, the, the 1960s one. I know there was a newer one. This is the one that always comes into mind where the utopia of the future is folk lying around, completely indifferent to what's going on, green fields, flowing water, completely cared for by another race of people. It's an emptiness that has no purpose in life but to simply exist and to be taken care of by others. However, emptiness always gets filled with something. And in this movie, that emptiness is filled by living as sheep for a slaughter. Jesus, getting away from the movies, Jesus gives us another vision of what happens when we merely seek an empty peace. In Matthew 12, 43, he tells us that when an impure spirit comes out of a person, it goes through arid places seeking rest. It does not find it. Then it says, I will return to the house I left. And when it arrives, it finds the house unoccupied, swept clean, everything in order. And then it goes and takes with it seven other spirits more wicked than itself. And they go in and they live there. And the final condition of that person is worse than the first. That is how it will be with this wicked generation. This is an empty peace. But friends, we do not have to be an empty generation. We do not have to be infested with something that makes our lives worse than before. No. Jesus brings a third blessing in our passage today. He breathes into us the Holy Spirit. In the beginning of the Old Testament, God breathed life into Adam. The prophet Ezekiel was shown a vision where a valley of old, dry bones were brought to life as God breathed into them. So the coming of the Holy Spirit to the disciples was like awakening of life from the dead. Our life without the Lord is going to be empty. Oh, I mean, we fill it with things. We fill it with stuff. We fill it most of the times with busyness with causes and politics and sports and music, different successes, all these things to keep us moving. Pastor Adrian Rogers tells us that if Satan can't make you bad, he makes you busy. It doesn't take blatant sin to rob us of what God has for us. Sometimes we miss it because we we fill our lives with busyness. Sometimes in the church, we're so busy doing stuff. We miss God all around us. I don't know. It seems apt that we're in the middle of a sermon series on things that are supernatural because this concept surely fits. The devil and his angels who followed him are tirelessly fighting to dilute the message of Jesus and the truth of the gospel. As Christ's church, we must never be out to propagate our own message. We must be out to share the message of Christ. The church must never be out to follow just man-made policies. No, the church must be out to follow the will of Christ. Barclay warns us that the church fails whenever she tries to solve some problem in her own wisdom and strength and leaves out the account, the will, and a guidance of Jesus Christ. We do not want to be a church 
of empty peace. Last November, I had the honor to preach and bring a message about good news, the gospel of Jesus Christ that changes us, that brings about new life, often referred to as being born again. And and it's, it's a good news that combats bad news. Well, believe it or not, there is good news in our world today. We don't often see it on our television or the news apps or our social media accounts, but even the good news that we can see when we look away from our screens pales beside the news of Christ Jesus' work on the cross, his resurrection and power over death, and the person of the Holy Spirit working in our lives this very day. Today's passage, it brings the breath of life into the lives of dry bones, dry bones cowering in fright, And we're going to find out what that is. Oh, there it is. Amber alert. Father God, may this child be found. Well, that's a reminder for prayer, isn't it? So, today's passage... It brings the breath of life into the lives of dry bones cowering in fright, these disciples. And Jesus brings not only forgiveness for sins, but the gift, the very person of the Holy Spirit to fill our lives in a way that nothing else could. Pastor Warren Wearsby tells us that wherever people were confronted with the reality of Jesus' resurrection, their lives were transformed. In fact, that same transforming experience can be yours today. That transformation that comes with the leading of the Holy Spirit is not one that can be explained or even understood by those outside of our faith. It just doesn't make sense. Peace, Jesus says and brings. But our circumstances of turmoil and suffering don't always change. What's up with that? It it just doesn't jive with what we're told peace should be in this world. But the more we learn about God, the more we learn about what is in the Bible, the more we learn about what Jesus said, the more we learn about how the Spirit leads us, we discover there's a huge difference between the definitions of God and the definitions of the world. I can't say that I had the perfect explanation for the suffering and turmoil that we continue to see daily. What I do know is that we can face it. We can face it, and we can face it with hope when we are filled with the Holy Spirit. Now, this takes some doing on our part. Jesus doesn't tell the disciples, peace be with you, now sit and be comfortable. You want me to make you a latte? No, Jesus tells them, as he tells us, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. For the disciples in today's passage, it's in the midst of fearful circumstances that Jesus appears to them collectively, speaking these words of peace over them. However, as we've seen, he doesn't stop there. He tells the disciples that he is sending them out into the world. And this is something that is not new to them. Jesus has sent them out while he was alive sent them out, and they performed miracles, and they healed people, and they were greeted, and they came back energized. And then he died, and their lives were threatened. This new sending means they're going to have to leave the safety of their locked room. But although their future is unknown, They are known by the one who holds the future in his hands. Wherever they go, whatever they face, Jesus' words remain true in these disciples. Peace is with them. The devotional that I read on Friday that brought me to these verses, it reads this way. Jesus continues to offer us this same peace. We will all face hardships, 
and difficulties. We will all go through seasons where we endure intense pain caused by struggling relationships, struggling economies, bad news, struggling health crises. But God's peace isn't based on our feelings or circumstances, which is why it's something that we can consistently experience. God's peace, well, sometimes it feels like calmness in the midst of anxiety. It can be hope despite a diagnosis we never wanted to hear. It can look like unexplainable joy or just an unshakable feeling that regardless of what happens, God is in control. It does take time, personal growth, spiritual maturity, and practice to rely on the Holy Spirit in our lives. For me, I, a lot of this is done through music. The songs that I hear, the songs that I sing, the songs that we sing. Hillsong United has this song called From the Inside Out. And to me, its words are a prayer to this end. The chorus sings, In my heart and my soul, Lord, I give you control. Consume me from the inside out. And my favorite verse says, Your will above all else. My purpose remains. The art of losing myself in giving you praise. The Spirit is working in you and me today to lose our worldly definitions and to gain a better understanding of what it means to have peace, what it means to succeed in life, what it means to have a worldview that is grounded in Christ Jesus and the power of the Holy Spirit working in our lives. It's hard sometimes. And we're tempted to fall into fear, to shock, to cynicism, to anger. I know that I'm tempted that way. And sometimes I succumb to that temptation. Thank God for His grace, amen? This is a grace where we can start over again, surrender our control, our very lives to God, even as we praise His name this morning together. His Spirit is alive in this place and in the lives of every follower of Christ Jesus around the world. Isn't that awesome? The King James Version of Scripture, and, and it is a footnote in the New King James as well, refers to the Holy Spirit as the comforter when Jesus tells of His coming to us. And there's a lot to be said about this role of the Spirit in our lives especially when we look at the news in our world, in our nation, even the news in our city today. Comforter, this doesn't mean curling up in a recliner with a cup of tea and a cat purring on my lap, as nice as that is. It means that we can continue to have hope in the Lord because of his promises during times of pain, suffering, and discomfort. He's the comforter. Jesus tells us, he promises us, in this world you will have trouble. But take heart, I have overcome the world. When he brings his peace, it stays in the times of trouble. When my wife Angela was facing the end of her life, she asked, how do people without Jesus, go through this. Her pain, the diagnosis, these troubles, ultimately her death to cancer could not take away the comfort and the peace that the Spirit supplied her. That is the peace that was given by our God to be with us through the best and the worst of times. When our world rages, or the doctor shares something alarming, or the news reports are terrifying or disgusting, God's peace enables us to walk forward with a confident assurance that the one who gives us peace goes with us. The Spirit might not remove us from difficult situations, but He will always walk through them. 
Outside pressures don't have the power to take away God's perfect peace that's given to us through Jesus, our Savior, and by his Spirit alive in us today. Friends, there will be days when we need the peace that only Jesus can bring. Today could be one of those days for you. And I know that when we go out in his name in response to his charge to make disciples of all the world, we will need this peace. The Reverend Pink writes, How unspeakably blessed are we to observe that the Lord first said, Peace be with you before I send you. The truth is that peace is the preparation for service. We do not go to receive the reward of peace. We are given this peace so that we can go. So when acts of violence threaten to break the peace of the world, when acts of horror mar the civilized scenes that we so desire, when corruption skews well-intentioned people to grasp at lies, and there are some who would blame God and cry, if there's a God, why is this happening? Well, brothers and sisters, as the Father sent the Son, so Jesus sends us. With the gift of the Holy Spirit, who brings wisdom, power, and strength, God sends us. Together, he sends us with an inner peace and an understanding that cannot be destroyed by the attack of the world and the corruption of sin. For Jesus spoke, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, I am sending you. Receive the Holy Spirit. These words are written that you might believe Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing, you may have life in his name, the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Would you pray with me? Father God, you are our great God, as we've sung many times today. And we know that your spirit is the greatest gift to move with us. We thank you for your son, for his work on the cross, for the destruction of death and the resurrection of life. And Lord, we admit we cannot go on living without you, without your spirit filling our empty lives. Help us to remember that as we leave this place, as we go home, as we go through our days, Lord. That life without you is just empty. But you have brought your peace and breathed the Holy Spirit. And we thank you for that and vow to live for you in Jesus' name. Amen.